Computer Museum in the heart of Silicon Valley, extracting the signal from the noise. It's the Cube, covering OpenStack Silicon Valley 2015, brought to you by Mirantis. Now your hosts, John Furrier and Jeff Frick. Okay, welcome back everyone. We are live in Silicon Valley for the Cube, Silicon Angle's flagship program. We go out to the events and extract the signal from the noise. I'm John Furrier, my co-host Jeff Frick here in Mountain View, one exit from our office in Palo Alto, and of course, one exit from the headquarters of Hewlett Packard, and our next guest is Mark Interante, Senior Vice President of HP Cloud. Welcome, and Senior Vice President of Engineering at HP Cloud. Welcome back to theCUBE, great to see you okay. again. Good seeing you too. We love uh, chatting with you, because uh, the insight's great. Last uh, interview at OpenStack Vancouver was awesome. A little bit different vibe there, a little bit chiller with the patches, you yes. were more you wore <laughs> jeans here in Silicon Valley, you got the nice shirt on, looking good. This is, this is the 408 <laughs> area code look. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the 415 is a bit different. Okay, so I want to jump right in. So yeah. the cloud's hot, we all know that. OpenStack yeah. is at an inflection point now. We're seeing great adoption. We're seeing some stability in winners with virtualization, compute, mm -hmm. a lot of stuff moving quickly in, up into the winner category. Mm -hmm. Co uh, Kubernetes is hot, mm -hmm. containers are hot. What's the big deal? I mean, people want to engineer DevOps, mm -hmm. and they want to do it with standard components. What's the status in your mind from an engineering standpoint? Yeah. Where are you guys seeing the traction on, on what's rising, what's trending? So I think, what, I think one, containers, everybody's talking about containers, it, it allows people to get the kind of, vir the kind of vir stuff they had in virtualization, they get it faster, easier, and it allows people to develop on their, on their PC in their cafe and be able to decompose their services and then deploy those onto a larger system. So certainly there's a lot of momentum, momentum there. The other thing we're seeing is with the matur maturation of OpenStack, is we're seeing people deploying OpenStack private clouds as an internal service provider and getting really big benefits from their, from their application development teams. Because their app dev teams want basically infrastructure, services, on demand, virtu in, a, in a virtual manner, so they can go spin up, dev, test, and even production environments without having to have meetings. And the thing they're trying to get away from is they do not want to meet with IT. They want to be able to do the work they want to do, they want to, be able to get the resources they want to have, and they want to be able to do their daily life without having to negotiate for, in the old world, we'd say fixed limited resource. OpenStack gives you the opportunity to see a near infinite resource from a developer's point of view. They can go spin up lots of different things, they can spin up databases and uh, storage systems, but they don't have to go negotiate and get services uh, deployed for them. They can do it themselves. They're much more empowered. Okay, talk about the OpenStack. Where do you, are you happy with where things are engineering-wise, and what areas you see that are really accelerating from an engineering standpoint? Where's the coding getting done? Where's the action? Well, there's a lot of good action in Neutron right now. Uh, I was at the, we hosted the Operator Summit a couple of weeks ago, had about 250 people there. These were people operating OpenStack, and people were saying, well, look, are you using Nova Networks or are you using Neutron? Now raise your hand if you're still using the old uh, Nova networks. One hand went up. Everybody else is on Neutron. So I think that was a good example of the fact we passed the barrier on Neutron being production grade, having the features and capabilities at once. The refactoring that we did that allows things like VPN as a service, firewall as a service, load balancer as a service, to be sub-projects and independently evolve has been a very good architectural change. And now those projects are picking up steam Particularly, I'm excited about the Octavia project, which allows uh, very large scalable load balancing and in the Neutron context, but it's decoupled. Um, and upgradability has made some big improvements this, uh, this last couple of releases. So I'm seeing people move forward in that area. Okay, so the number one question that I get yeah. when I talk to customers in the industry, what's going on with HP? I'll see the splits coming yeah. up on November 1st is the official date. Mm -hmm. You guys have been operating as a split company from the enterprise team and the printer, whatever they would call it, HP, whatever that is, yeah. um, as separate companies now for a while. We kind of, we kind of, everyone kind of knows that, it's yes. out there. What does that mean for the cloud group? Does that make you guys a little bit more free to do things? Is it business as usual? What new changes is happening? What can we expect from HP Cloud in the new Enterprise. Oh sure. If you could share, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> well, I, can, I can tell you what I can tell you. Okay. So, uh, <laughs> so one, I think this is this really going to is going to allow the enterprise team to be much more focused around its customer base, which is large scale enterprises and enterprise developers. So that focus for us uh, is, is 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 helpful. It allows us to be able to get more people's time around figuring out how to solve the core problems and making sure we've got good routes to market for the different solutions that the Cloud BU is, is developing. 
So I think our partnership uh, with the different other groups that are going to compose HP Enterprise uh, has really accelerated here in the last six months, both working with the, the hardware group, the EG group, the services group, and the software group. What's going on with the, um, the trend that we're seeing with Docker containers? Because that was certainly a euphoric moment, go back two years when we interviewed Solomon at Red Hat Summit. It wasn't even the big deal at that point. Now it's kind of blown up to be a huge deal. You got Kubernetes around the corner. It speaks to this new abstraction layer that's being developed, which speaks to accelerated deployments. So I got to ask you from a, from a uh, perspective of DevOps. Yep. We're moving to a lightweight environment, it seems. We want lightweight. They yes. want standard plug and play. Yeah. That means the old model of heavy, fat code <laughs> is yes. going away. So, where's OpenStack related? Is it lightweight enough, or is it doing well and being lightweight, horizontally scalable, yet integrate with the integrated stack so, model? So, I think that's part of the evolution that OpenStack's going through, is making itself more componentized internally. Um, you know, if you look at the journey over the last three years, we've continued to refactor and build out smaller and smaller services. If you go back, few years ago, I mean, storage storage was completely part of Nova. Networks were part of Nova. I mean, all, almost all of this started off as uh, one set of code. And as we've continued to recompartmentalize and make it smaller, independent services, I think that's helped our agility. It's also helped our focus in driving up higher quality. This is clearly where people want to go. And I think OpenStack is well seen as a DevOps project. It yeah. is a project, not only a piece of complex code, but it's one that people run in a DevOps manner many of the people who are developing it are running it, and certainly we are. So you guys at HP, and I, I was there back in the 90s, I worked there nine years from the 80s and 90s, and HP always was a leader at new stuff, with the first biggest intranet at one point during the, the, the web days, first web, website on the, on the Mosaic browser, one of the first handful of websites. You guys always kind of eat your own dogs, whatever the metaphor yeah. is. Can you share some insight of what you guys are doing with OpenStack internally, and what, what, thing, yeah. what, are your kick, what tires are you kicking, what are you learning, and what can you share with folks? Well. Um, Sure, a couple of things. Uh, so one, we use OpenStack increasingly more internally in our development environments and in our, so we run, we run something we internally call Gozer, externally it's called uh, OpenStack Infra, which is a very large CI CD system. Uh, we use that internally for all of our builds. And so we're continuously running against you know, thousands of machines trying to basically to build and deploy our both upstream OpenStack and also the patches that we're holding and the things that we're doing for our customers. Um, we also have a really good partnership with HP IT. That's one of the largest IT organizations in the world. It's I don't know, probably in the top 20 yeah. or 50. I don't know exactly how big, but it's quite large. It's pretty massive. It is, <laughs> and and they are early adopters of, of our OpenStack technology, of our Helium development platform, which is based on Cloud Foundry. So they're a great partner for us to give us a real good, clear, honest feedback and, and clear Great like, customer internally for you oh, guys, They right? really are. And we're making strides over our next couple of releases to get more and more adoption with them. So I got to ask, I asked every question, yeah. every guest the same question on theCUBE this week at the OpenStack, so I'll ask you, does hybrid cloud exist? Is it like a concept? Is it, a, is, it a, is it an actual product? Is it an outcome? We know public cloud, what that is. Yeah, yeah. We know what private cloud is. Yeah. Hybrid cloud certainly is being, the buzz is at an all time high, but Actually, is it a product, is it a category, or is it an outcome, is it how you deploy? Uh, What's your take on that? I think it's a category. I don't think it's a product. I mean, I remember when I was talking to one of my CEOs a long time ago, and he wanted me to build this thing. And I said, got it, okay, let me give you a taxonomy. There are bugs, there are features, there are products, there are product lines, and there are industries above that, and kind of categories, which is an industry. Um, I think hybrid cloud is a descriptor of a large way in which clouds are being deployed today. People use a variety of different ways to describe a private cloud, I mean a, a hybrid cloud. Sometimes it's public and private. Sometimes it's either public or private and non-virtualized. Just I have a bunch of regular gear that is all optimized to work the way it is. I want to easily connect that into the cloud resources. And you see companies doing that every day. People aren't doing wholesale rewrites of their massive systems. Yeah. They're looking at their massive system and they're going, the massive system is actually composed of 20 subsystems. Yeah. These right. two right. are the ones under stress. So how do they need to, they're evolving in some, for some reason. Let's go evolve those in a cloud manner and still keep the other 18 just in maintenance mode where they are or in low evolution mode. And the other two will put in a DevOps environment, will have it heavily evolved, but it will interconnect in. I think you see that all the, all the time in the industry right now. 
So what makes it hybrid then? If, if you've got, say, one call between a public and a private, or you've got, you know, you've got a public cloud and it, it, it needs one piece of data that's not coming there, is that just a connector with Direct Connect? Does it take some critical mass of, of connections or dependencies between the two to call it hybrid cloud? I mean, when, when you're talking to customers and they're trying to conceptualize, where, I, where do I put what? I, I think what's, what's interesting is you don't just put things anywhere by themselves nope. anymore, they're all connected to other things. So is it, yeah. is it the definition of the number, intensity, variety of connections that defines whether that particular stack of gear is a, is a hybrid cloud or a private cloud? I, I think we cloud. kind of end, end up in semantics on some lines that are quite fuzzy, but what right. you end up with is most large applications kind of fit into a broad definition of hybrid. And then the real conversation is at the next level down. How do I refactor or rewrite a, a subsystem easily and quickly and evolve it? And uh, you get companies you know, well within a mile of here that are deep on that evolution and have been for, well, I, was, I was doing some of this work uh, not eight, eight, nine years ago at Yahoo. We had old stools, we had you know Yahoo Finance, which is one of my properties. It used to run 20 or so big subsystems. I needed to evolve three of them rapidly. We would use instant hardware, which is what we called cloud back then. <laughs> because I mean, you get, you get a thousand physical machines in a couple of minutes, it seems pretty instant to, to me. Well, right. the web guys right. early on, they were all running the cloud native. That was native cloud exactly. essentially at the time. Exactly, so as we evolved that, we evolved it in, in those manners. And that's what you see kind of more mainstream in, in enterprises doing kind of every day. And so I end up having conversations with uh, VPs of infrastructure or CIOs about, let's walk through the, your portfolio, how do you want it to evolve? Where are the rates of evolution highest? Which tells me, where, how do you need to get a more agile infrastructure underneath that to reduce the friction? Right, right. And then build lots of connectors as a toolkit so that it's easier to move data back and forth. Right. So, well, so well, I was going to just follow up on that, that. When you're talking to the to the customers, right, there's clearly some stuff that there's just no reason to touch it. It works, it's, it's sitting, it's been running forever. Yeah. And, it, and clearly if it's a brand new application, right, should Check probably want to go cloud first or yeah. at least tell me why, why we shouldn't. Right. When, you're, when they're evaluating what potentially should move, mm -hmm. What are the kind of the really key criteria that you review with them that says, yes, this is worth the effort to move it from the existing infrastructure to more of a cloud-based infrastructure? That's a great question. I kind of think of it as kind of portfolio analysis. You're looking at your portfolio of, of subsystems and you start to ask some questions. Like one, um, is are there, are there any, what does the requirements change per month or quarter? And sort it, is it really low? Okay, well, that's good. Is it high? Okay, this is under more pressure to evolve. Um, what's my maintenance cost on it? Like maintenance per subsystem. Is it kind of low and stable and it's a, it's a, a small team and it's kind of under control? Or is there a pretty high maintenance burden? And those are kind of the two of the, probably the first two factors you look at. Okay. And you start to say, okay, if it's, if it's in that quadrant with high evolution and relatively high maintenance, maintenance costs, you either want to do automation, let's go make sure we can automate the deployments and the QA and the CI infrastructure, and how do you get an agile way to test it with an, with an infrastructure that allows kind of CI CD. So Mark, we got one minute left. Right. I want to just drill on, give you guys a chance to talk about what's going on with HP. Hmm. Share what's happening with the engineering, the product, the vision. People want to know the HP story. Obviously okay. the big news is the HP Enterprise is going to be a focused organization, <laughs> and the, the consumer stuff's going to be separate. That's pretty much out there. With the cloud group, what are you guys doing? Obviously, any updates, Any share any um, story updates, personnel updates, That's product well, updates? Well, we're, um, we're obviously working on new, new releases of products. We've got some stuff in beta that I'll be happy to tell you about. Uh, next time we talk, uh, we'll have customer successes by then. When's that going to be released? Uh, very soon. <laughs> okay. 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 It, it's, already, it's already in some customer hands. Pro probably by London, if I had drive over. By uh, London. Right. Come by over London, take, hopefully. You can come over and take a look at it. Okay. Uh, you know, we just bought a, a Staccato, which is going to help enhance our Cloud Foundry development application team. Very excited to have that team join us, and I'm looking forward to kind of the next evolutions of our Cloud Foundry, uh, more developer-oriented products and families. What's the number one thing you're hearing from customers as you talk to customers? Features, product line, updates, what's the, what are they looking for? Uh, what's the number one thing they're looking for? They're looking for, for experienced help in making a transition to be an internal service provider. They said, I want to do it, but like how, people, processes, obviously technology, training, how do I go engage my app devs and say, I've now got a full, fully featured private cloud for you, how do we make this happen? You know, after it's all installed, happy and running. It's, it's day two. 
and how do we make that transition happen? Having a lot of conversations about that. You're, you're lucky to have worked at Yahoo. You've seen that generation of people being first generation cloud native, DevOps, that culture's ingrained in all the, the Yahoo, Facebooks, Google, you've seen it. Everyone wants, everyone wants to be cloud native right now. So I got to ask you, what advice would you give uh, customers and people watching? Um, what roadmap? How do I get started? I want some of that cloud native infrastructure. I want agility, I want OpEx, I want workload mobility, I want all those benefits. I have, you know, Yahoo, Google, Facebook envy. How do I get there? You got, so here's how you do it. One, it's a journey. Step one is commit to getting a CI process in place and commit to automating your infrastructure. Do that and start getting releases done every month. If you're not, if you're getting them done every month, tell everybody in two months, we're going to do them every two weeks. And it's fractal. Okay, and yeah. just tell them, it keeps going in half every couple of months. And at some point, you'll have teams that have reduced all the infrastructure costs and complexity down, so they'll be able to say, I'm releasing every day. And you'll tell them, great, you're now within a factor of 100 of the most advanced tech companies who release 100 times a day. But 100 once a day is awesome. You never thought you could be there a year ago. So baby steps kind of, and if you will, go down and, and get iterated, get the CI going. Yeah. Get the continuous innovation and, 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 and development, agile if you will. And just keep going. Double yeah. it every couple There's of There's no months. silver bullet, it's an iterative no. process. It's an iterative process and just find the roadblocks, find what costs time, find, find ways to do it smaller and, and easier. Mark, thanks so much for sharing that insight great, here on theCUBE. Again, tips. Senior Vice President of Engineering, has been there, done that, doing some great stuff at HP. Great to have you back on theCUBE, sharing your insights. We'll be back more uh, here in Silicon Valley after the short break. This is theCUBE at the OpenStack Silicon Valley event. Right now.